Hi everybody, it's me, Miss Denny, your favorite children's librarian. Thanks for joining me for this edition of the Weekly Read. We have been reading The Boxcar Children, the original, the first, written in 1924 by Gertrude C. Warner. And today we are going to pick up where we left off. Today's chapter is chapter 15 called A New Grandfather. But if you have missed the previous chapters, no worries. They're all here on our YouTube page in the playlist, The Weekly Read. So make sure you check those out and then join us with chapter 15, which we're going to start right now. In less than an hour, the town was buzzing with the news. The chauffeur told the maids and the maids told the grocery man and the grocery man went from house to house telling that old James Courtesy had found his four grandchildren at last. In fact, the biggest part of the town knew it before the children themselves. Jess and Benny came across the lawn to select some white moonflowers for Violet's tray. They were just in time to hear Henry say, but grandfather, Grandfather, echoed Jess, whirling around to gaze at them. Yes, Jess, said Henry eagerly. He's the man we've been running away from all this time. I thought you was old, observed Benny, and awfully cross. Jess said so. I didn't know, Benny, said Jess, turning pink, to think of running away from this kind friend. But her grandfather did not seem to mind. He stroked her short, silky hair and promised that they will all go up to Violet's room with the moonflowers. There was no stopping Benny. He rushed into Violet's room, dragging his grandfather by one hand and shouting, it's grandfather Violet and he's nice after all, and I shouldn't wonder. When Violet at last understood just what Benny was trying to tell, she was perfectly happy to rest against her ruffled pillows with one hand curled about her grandfather's arm and listen to the rest. Where have you been living? demanded Mr. Courtesy at last. The whole company looked at each other, even Dr. McAllister and his mother. Then they all laughed as if they would never stop. You just ought to see, observed Dr. McAllister, wiping his eyes. What? said the children all at once. You never saw it in the daytime. You don't mean it, returned the doctor, teasing him. I have seen it quite a number of times in the daytime. Seen what in heaven's name? asked Mr. Courtesy at last. Then they told him, interrupting each other to tell about the beds of pine needles, the wonderful dishes, the freight car roof overall, the fireplace, and the swimming pool. That's where Violet got her bronchitis, observed the doctor, sitting by that pool. She shouldn't have done it. I thought so from the first. You thought so, repeated Henry, puzzled. How did you know she sat by it? I'm sure I didn't myself. I was your most frequent visitor, declared the doctor, enjoying himself hugely. I hope you are our only one, said Jess with her mouth open. Well, I think I was, said the doctor. The first night after Henry mowed my lawn, I followed him as far as the hill to see where he lived. Why did you do that? Interrupted Mr. Courtesy. I liked his looks, returned the doctor, and I noticed he didn't tell much about himself, so I was curious. But you surely didn't see the freight car then, said Jess. No, but I came back that night and hunted around, replied Dr. McAllister. At about 11 o'clock, Henry cried. The doctor assented. Our rabbit, said Henry and Jess together. I made as little noise as possible when I saw the freight car. Then I saw the door move, so I thought someone was inside. And when I heard the dog bark, I was sure of it and went home. But you came back? Questioned Jess. Yes, every time I knew all of you were safe in my garden, I made you a little visit, just to make sure you were having enough to eat and enough dishes. The doctor laughed. When I found you had a strainer and a vase of flowers and a salt shaker and a gl cut glass punch bowl, I stopped worrying. Didn't you suspect they were my children? Demanded Dr. Courtesy. Didn't you notice my advertisement? Why didn't you notify me at once? They were having such a good time, confessed the doctor, and I was too. I just wanted to see how long they could manage their own affairs. It was all tremendously interesting. Why, that boy and girl of yours are born business managers, Mr. Courtesy. Mr. Courtesy took note of this. But I don't see yet how you knew Violet sat by the pool, said Jess curiously. You couldn't know that, of course, replied the doctor. I went up twice when I knew Henry had taken the dog down to my barn to catch rats. I hid behind the big white rock with the flat top. 
That's Lookout Rock, explained Jess, where we used to let Benny watch for Henry, but we didn't hear you. No, said Dr. McAllister, I didn't even snap a twig those times, but I had the very best time when I went with mother. Have you seen it too, cried the children. I have indeed, returned Mrs. McAllister. I have even had a drink from your well. Everyone has seen it but me, said Mr. Courtesy patiently. We'll show it to you, screamed Benny, and I'll show you my wheels made on a cart and my bed made out of hay and my pink cup. Good for you, Benny, said Mr. Courtesy, pleased. When Violet gets well, we'll all go up there, and if you'll show me your house, I'll show you mine. Have you got a house? asked Benny in surprise. Yes, you can live there with me if you like it, replied Mr. Courtesy. I have been looking for you for nearly two months. Under Mr. Mrs. McAllister's wonderful care, Violet soon became strong again. But she had been skipping around the garden for several days before the doctor would allow the visit to the freight car house. When at last the whole party started out in the great limousine, many, many people looked out of their windows to watch after Mr. Courtesy and his grandchildren. Many of them knew Henry as the boy who had won the race and were glad he had found such a friend. But when the children reached their beloved home, they were like wild things. Watch capered about furiously, taking little swims in the pool and sniffing at all the dear old familiar things. Mr. Courtesy seated himself on a rock and watched them all, exchanging a glance now and then with Mrs. McAllister and her son. See our building, shouted Henry for that was what he always called the fireplace. It really burns too. And this is the well, and this is the dishpan, and this is the refrigerator. At last, everyone climbed into the car itself, and Mr. Courtesy saw the beds, the cash account on the wall, the wonderful shelf, and each separate dish. Each dish had a story of its own. That's more than my dishes have, observed Mr. Courtesy. Mrs. McAllister, who knew what his dishes were, was silent. They ate chicken sandwiches on the very same tablecloth and Benny drank from his pink cup and Watch couldn't understand why they went away all at, why they went away at all. But it was a trifle cool on the hill now when the sun began to sink and after rolling the door shut, they left regretfully. Tomorrow, suggested Mr. Courtesy as they drove home, will you all come and see my house? Oh yes, agreed the children happily, little dreaming what was in store for them on the next day and all the days to come. That's the end of chapter 15. Let's read the next chapter, number 16, A United Family. Mr. Courtesy had been planning this day for more than a week. He had sent his most trusted foreman to his own beautiful home to superintend matters there. The house was being remodeled entirely after Mr. Courtesy's own plans, and everywhere were carpenters, painters, and decorators. On the very day that Mr. Courtesy received word that it was finished, he suggested the drive. Do you live all alone, grandfather? asked Benny. All alone, answered Mr. Courtesy. No company at all. At first, Benny did not consider this the exact truth. He considered a cook company and also a butler and a housekeeper. And he, when he saw the array of maids, he kept perfectly quiet. The house was enormous, certainly. It was at least a quarter of a mile from its own front gate, and everywhere were gardens. Do you live here? said Henry, thunderstruck, as they rolled quietly along the beautiful drive. You do too if you like it, observed his grandfather, watching his face. The inside of the house was more wonderful than even the older children had ever dreamed. The velvet rugs were so thick and soft that no footfall could be heard. Everywhere were flowers. The great stairway with steps of marble rose from the center of the big hallway, but it was upstairs that the children felt most at home. Here the rooms were not quite so large. They were sunny and homelike. This is Violet's room, cried Benny. It was unmistakable. There were violets on the wallpaper. The bed was snow white with a thick quilt of violet silk. On the little table were English violets pouring their fragrance into the room. What a beautiful room, sighed Violet, sinking down into one of the soft cushion chairs. But all the children shouted when they saw Benny's room. The wallpaper was blue, covered with large figures of cats and dogs, the three bears and Peter Rabbit. There was a swinging rocking horse, nearly as large as a real horse, a blackboard, a tool chest, 
and low tables and chairs, exactly the right height for Benny. There was an electric train with cars nearly as large as the little boy himself. Can I run the cars all day, asked Benny. Oh no, replied Henry quickly. You're going to school as soon as it begins. This was the first that his grandfather had heard about school, but he agreed with Henry and chuckled to himself. The finest schools in the country, he said. This came true for all the children finally went to the public schools. And are they not the finest schools in the country? In Jess's room, Bunny discovered a bed for watch. It was in fact a regular dog straw hamper, but it was lined with heavy quilted silk and padded with wool. Watch got in and at once, sniffed every corner, turned around three times and lay down. Just then a distant doorbell rang. It had such a low musical chime that the children listened delightedly, never having once given a thought as to who it might be. But almost at once a soft-footed servant appeared saying that a man wanted to see Mr. Courtesy about the dog. The moment Jess heard the word dog, she was frightened. She had never thought watch a common runaway dog and it always made her uncomfortable to see passers-by gazing curiously at him as he ran by her side. They won't take watch away, she whispered to Henry, her breath almost gone. Indeed, they will not, declared Henry. We're never, never give him up. However, Henry followed his grandfather and Jess with great anxiety. It was indeed about watch that the man wanted to talk and Jess's heart sank again when she saw the dog jump delightedly upon the man and return his caresses with short barks. He's a runaway, sir, from my kennels out in Townsend the man explained to Dr. Courtesy, or to Mr. Courtesy rather. I have 200 Airedales out there and this one sold the day before he ran away. So you see, I have to turn him over to the lady I sold him to. Oh no, you don't, returned Mr. Courtesy quickly. I will give you three times what the dog is worth. The man glanced around uneasily. I couldn't do that, sir. You see, it isn't a question of money, it's a question of my word promised to the lady. Mr. Courtesy failed to see. She can find another dog among 200 Airedales, I guess, he returned. And besides, you don't know positively that this is the right dog. Excuse me, replied the man, very much embarrassed. He's the dog, all right. He knows me, as you see. His name is Ruff Number 3. He has a black spot inside his ear. It was too true. Indeed, the mere mention of his name, the dog cocked an ear and wagged his tail but he had seated himself as close to Jess as possible and licked her hand when she patted him. But it appeared Henry could, under, could understand the man's position even if Mr. Courtesy could not. He now put in a timid word of his own. If the lady would agree to let the dog go, would you be willing? Sure, said the man, shooting a glance at Henry. I almost know anyone would let us keep watch, grandfather, said Henry earnestly, if they knew how much he had done for us. I'm sure of it, my boy, returned Mr. Courtesy kindly. The fact that Henry had been the first to make headway with the dog fancier had not escaped him. But it was clear that Jess had, would not be able to sleep until the matter was settled. So the moment the man had gone, the children set out from their beautiful new home to the address of the lady who had bought watch. The big car purred along from the Greenfield to Townsend in no time. And the whole family, including Watch himself, trooped up the veranda steps to interview the lady who held it in her power to break their hearts or to make them very happy. She was not terrible to look at. In fact, she was quite young, quite lively, and very, very pretty. She asked them all to sit down, which they did gravely. For even Benny was worried about losing Watchy, his favorite pillow. He could not wait for his grandfather to begin. He struggled down from his chair and dashed over to the young lady, saying in one breath, You'll let us keep watchy, please, you, won't you? Because we want him so bad, and Jess didn't know he was your dog. By degrees, the lady understood just what the dog it was. We have had him so long, explained Henry eagerly. It would be almost like letting Benny go away. Watch never leaves us, even for a minute, ever since Jess took the briar out of his foot. So you are the children who lived in the freight car, observed the lively young lady. I've heard all about that. How did you like it? All right, replied Henry with effort, but we never could have done it without watch. He stayed and looked after the girls while I was away and he just thinks everything of Jess. Well, said the young lady laughing, I can see you're worrying terribly about that dog. Now listen, I wouldn't take that dog away from you any more than I'd take Benny. 
In fact, not so much. I think maybe I'd like to keep Benny instead. Benny was apparently quite willing that she should. He climbed into her lap before anyone could stop him and gave her one of his best hugs. And from that moment, they were firm friends. The children always spoke of her as the lady who owns watch, although Mr. Courtesy paid for the dog in less time than you can imagine. It made no difference to the children that watch was a very valuable dog. They had loved him when he had not been worth a cent, and now they loved him more, simply because they had so nearly lost him. It was a happy and reunited family which gathered around the courtesy dining table that evening. The maids smiled in the kitchen to hear the children laugh, and the children laughed because Watch actually sat up at the table in the seat of honor beside Jess and was waited upon by the butler. <laughs> Uh, and that is where we're going to end for today. There is just one more chapter left. The last one, it's called Safe. Join me again next time for that final chapter. Take care, friends. Bye-bye.